Hi, everybody. It is April 10th, 2013, if you can believe that. Taxes are almost due. Oh, my God. Um, it is a little bit afternoon here in Los Angeles, California. My name is Dan Bull. I'm president of 65 Amps. And welcome to Lunch with Dan Bull via Ustream. Uh, for those of you watching the recording, this is a live show that happens every Wednesday noon Pacific time, which is Greenwich Mean Time minus 8 for those of you in Europe, GMT minus 8, and uh, goes for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and uh, we like to play guitar a lot here, which I'm not going to do this week because I suck. Um, I've almost, I've got my plan here where I, I'm, I'm really close to being able to make noise. Um, so normally uh, there is, if you choose to join us live, which I highly encourage, there is a chat window here that I'm going to be reading questions from and answering live questions. And it's kind of fun. It ends up being sort of like being on the witness stand for me. I get questions just thrown at me and there's this delay on the internet. So they all kind of come in hodgepodge and um, I do my best to keep up. Uh, any subject is cool um, that pertains to music and all these other things. Uh, we talk about amplifiers, we talk about pedals, we talk about pickups, we talk about recording, we talk about whatever. Um, I try to do my best to answer all the questions that get thrown at me. And we try intentionally to have a good time. The occasional cuss word may slip out, so don't be offended by that. We're all adults here. I think it's all men here as well. Um, so that gives us a certain amount of freedom with our vocabulary that you normally don't have in public. There's a rumor going around that I forgot how to play guitar, says Bass Face Josh. Yeah, that's what they said at my gig on Saturday. It's like, dude, what the hell? Um, no, man, watch. Here, let me show you something. Ready? Watch this. How about that? I know how to do that. Is that good, Josh? Come on. How about that? Oh, wait a minute, Harry, are you ready? I got another one for you, are you ready? Where's it go? <laughs> What's the last chord? God, I haven't played that in so long. <laughs> it's D major. Oh, yeah. So is that okay, Josh? What song is that? Our lawyers will be, oh, I know, the Zeppelin police on me again. That's what got me last time, wasn't the Zeppelin. You know what I was listening to on the way in? Sunshine of Your Love. Is that what you want? The acoustic jukebox. Yeah, I still have the dirty blondes in here. That's right. Getting me down. Yeah. You know what I was listening to on the way in um, today that I forgot? Does your bridge float? Um, no, not really. I kind of like it up against the body. It stays in tune better. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Does your bridge float? It sounds like a Monty Python line, doesn't it? For the Brits, understand. Does you or no? I know what it is. It's just like um, oh, I got a whammy bar. I just can't pull it up. Um, uh, it sound, it reminds me of the Pink Panther thing where he's in the hotel in Switzerland. You know, does you dug bite? <laughs> Exactly, Justin got it. That is not my dog. <laughs> so yeah, what I heard on the win was uh, Linda Ronstadt. Man, I forgot how good that girl could sing in the 70s. She was doing the um, Everly Brothers tune. It's way out of my range. When will I be loved? When I find a new love, I find one more. Man, that girl could sing. Yeah, that was good. They did, uh, I don't know what I was listening to, but they did sort of a little Linda Ronstadt mix today. And it was all covers. So they did that. They did her version of Back in the USA, the Chuck Berry song. Um, and what was one other one she did? There's two others. She did uh, It's So Easy to Fall in Love, Buddy Holly. And she did You're No Good, Carol King song. Forget the chords on that. But, uh, yeah, that's funny. They axed the 50s oldies and replaced them with 70s covers of 50s oldies. Yeah, she had a great band. It was Waddy Wack. Well, the recordings were the Eagles. I mean, it was Glenn Fry and Don Henley on her first couple records, first two or three records. Peter Asher was her producer. And um, he got the best session guys in L.A., and it was Don Henley and Glenn Fry. When you listen to those vocals, you can just hear it. Um, before they were the Eagles, you know, they were just session guys here in town. Living in Laurel Canyon, smoking weed, hanging out at the Troubadour, like you do. Um, yeah, and Lee Sklar, that's right. Lee Sklar was playing bass. Andrew Gold played. Hey, John. Sadly, he says, sadly, I've got to check out. His son needs putting to bed. He doesn't. Oh, well, John, thank you for checking in. We'll be here for an hour. Um, so we'd love to have you back. But anyway, everyone, John Priest from Peach Guitars in Essex, in England. Um, so if you are British or in the area, please ring up John to get your 65 amps. Justin says, listen to him in the kids' room. It'll put the kid to sleep. <laughs> sure, man. You ready? I used to do this to my daughters all the time. Can you guys hear that? country western version of Bach or Brahms <laughs> good night young Tommy oh uh, yeah 
sweet dreams, young Tommy. Little country western version of Brahms. It works. Seriously, if you have acoustic guitar, it's just G, C, and D. Uh, acoustic guitar in Tommy's bedroom. I highly recommend it. If you don't have an acoustic guitar in Tommy's bedroom, I highly recommend getting one there. Hi, Ken. How are you, buddy? put my kids to sleep doing that 500 times maybe yeah okay let's get back to real questions here good night Tommy um Rob Clute asked, Dan, do you generally use a 16 ohm speaker than a 112? Any particular reason for that? Yes and yes. Um, we always use 16 ohms. Uh, we set all of our cabinets up to 16 ohms. And there's a couple of good reasons for that. Um, <laughs> chill. Um, one of which is amps always sound better on the higher taps because you're using the entire output transformer. Also, all of our amps have parallel speaker outputs, so you can hook up two cabinets. If you have an amp that has like a 16, an 8, and a 4-ohm jack, um, then you can't run two cabinets together. Unless they're different impedances, but it still it doesn't work right. Um, so if you start out high, every time you add a speaker cabinet of the same value, it divides. So if we start at 16... You do two cabinets and you end up at 8 ohms. You always want to try to run the highest tap you can on your output transformer because if you have a good output transformer, it makes a big difference. Ustreamer 266869. Refresh your bedroom. Refresh, I'm reading another line. Refresh your bedroom volume, please. Um... Refresh your browser, and then we can see what your name is. First time watching live, snowed out of the real job. Oh, where do you live? You're all snowed in. This is my snow music. You're in Wyoming. How much snow do you have? This is bedroom volume, that's right. Yes, Praneet, you got it. Eight to 12 inches, yeah, you're home. Do you live in town or you're outside? Oops. <laughs> Outside a small town, yeah, so they're probably not plowing your roads yet, are they? Okay, so I'm getting distracted playing guitar, which is why I haven't um, been talking enough. And you need you guys came in here to talk, not listen to me play a guitar that's not plugged in. I apologize. 
FB and a bunch of numbers says, Dan, what 65 amp would be the best for a small club gig and most pedal friendly? Um, what kind of music do you play? FB 77145703. Hi, Stratocaster Mojo. Hey, it's a Stratocaster. Perfect. And it's got Mojo. I'm serious. It does. Pop and classic rock. All right, what kind of guitar do you play? Man, San Francisco, Ken. We got to sort that out. I, who do I call in San Francisco? I mean, there's only rockers and Gelb, right? Is there any other place that carries high-end gear? I guess I just need to call rockers. Let me put that on my notes over here. Call SFO. Um... You know, for small clubs, I really recommend the, the telephone ring. Um, oh, so you got a wide variety of guitars. Who's calling? Lightning Joes. I'll have to call you back, Lightning Joes. Um, that's one of our dealers. Yeah, you can come down to L.A. Um Sorry, the way to the phone quits yelling at us. Um, SLO? What are you talking about, Justin? SFO. Um, yeah, man. Uh, you can come down. I mean, I don't have much to show you here at the shop, but True Tone has a really nice stock. Buy it in Santa Monica. Griffin in Palo Alto in a little Silicon Valley. Yeah. Yeah, Ken, I mean, if you're coming down, let me know. I'll buzz over to True Tone and say hi. Close to Gelb, but you know what? Gelb's not... I don't know what's going on with those guys. I hardly ever hear from them. I think the peninsula is kind of hard for people to get to. Yeah, I mean, that's true. So back to the original question, um, which amps are good for small clubs? Um, most of our amps are really pretty pedal friendly already. Um, it just depends on what you want to do. Um, bananas at large, I'll try it. And... Um, the, for small clubs, the, like the Elvis and the Tupelo are really popular for that. I think I just posted on the fans of 65 Amps page. Go check that out. Um, Steve Kirk, who lives in Oakland, um, playing a blues gig with his little Elvis. And he's on stage with a band, small club. You know, it sounds great. Um, the Ventura and the London Pro are also really good for those sorts of things. Oh, you streamer two six six eight six nine. This is a bad question. Hi, Norwegian Slomo. What do you recommend as a sixty-five amps equivalent to a Fender Hot Rod Deville? Are you serious? <laughs> uh, guitar showcase in San Jose. I don't know what a Fender Hot Rod Deville sounds like. Sorry. That's kind of like saying, which Ferrari do you think would be similar to my Camaro? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude. I'm just kidding. But I honestly, it's apples and oranges. Uh, Stratocaster Mojo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Dude, I, that's rude. I uh, you're probably a wonderful, nice guy sitting there typing an honest question, and we just shit all over you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know what a Fender Hot Rod DeVille does. I've never played one. Um, what are you going for? What kind of sound do you like? Because a Fender Hot Rod DeVille is made 
with the absolute cheapest components in China. And um, it's just such a different animal. I don't know what's the power section on that. Is it... Um, I love Camaros. Don't get me wrong. Okay, I, may, I shouldn't have said Camaro. Is what Ferrari is just like my Kia. Uh, yeah, they might be made in Mexico. I don't know. We're talking about two six v sixes. I know they make some with the L eighty fours. They make some with six L sixes. So it's a grid by a six L six. Oh, good, you're laughing. Yeah, I really didn't mean to be rude there. It was just kind of a funny question. Um, uh, um, what was the name of that other store in San Francisco you guys were talking about? Guitar Emporium or something? What was it? I can't see it on here. This thing doesn't scroll very well. Griffin in Palo Alto, Bananas at Large, Guitar Showcase in San Jose. Okay. Um, DeVille has two 6L6s. Uh, the only 6L6 amp that I make is the producer, which is our top end thing. John, you're back already. Did my Brahms lullaby put Tommy to sleep? I'm telling you, man, it works, dude. Uh, bananas at large. Yeah, they're not one of our dealers, Ken. I, I need... Um... Blackface type preamp triode, stack triode, with extra gain stage that can be switched in. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the producer 6L. Um, yeah, Stratocaster Mojo, thank you for saying that. It's really a different animal um, than a printed circuit board fender in every respect. Um, the distortion on the um, the producer is outstanding, I think. Because um, we're doing, that's our high current low voltage thing. So you can get a lot out of that amp. Um, the clean sounds are, you can go from very dry, sterile sort of black face clean to a little more woolly, nice uh, tweed clean. Um, I know Jay Rosen, yeah. It's kind of hard for those guys because they, they make their money. They make so much money selling guitars that they don't care about amps. Um, I I'm glad you brought up Jay, though. I haven't thought about him in a long time. He's a nice guy. Oh, he showed up at your gig at Viva? Um, but um, So anyway, the Producer 6L, yeah, you can get some really good broad-ranging clean sounds. And when you go over to the British side of the amp, you get some really cool distortion. There's two very distinct different distortions there, uh, verging on sort of 90s boogie stuff. I think Blink-182 type distortions. Um, But the, the quality of the build and the components are just worlds and worlds and worlds apart. Um, the Fender stuff, actually, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just being rude, but um, th that level of Fender amps are a really good deal for the money. If I had a kid, you know, in ninth grade playing guitar or something, that'd probably be one of the things I'd go get him. That or, a, you know, ch Chinese AC30 or something. But, um... um they're not what I would call robust, if that makes sense. Um, they're sort of entry-level gear. Um, was there a price reduction on the producer? Yes, we, we lowered it several hundred dollars. 
That's what I say. Stratocaster Mojo says it's their most popular amp right now. Um, I believe it. It's a good deal. It's really, I don't think they're like 800 bucks or something, 900 bucks. Um, excuse me, sorry. There's really nothing wrong with that amp. It's just different. Um, so I didn't mean to be rude. I'm just being a smart ass. The price reduction is reflected on our website, I believe. It used to be $3,800. It should be $3,495 now. Is that not correct? If not, I can fix that. Let me go double check here while we're talking. Pentagon to cut up to 50,000 jobs. Ooh. Let's see. Amps, producer, uh, yeah, thirty-four ninety-five. That's correct. So Bob in New Jersey said, "How is the how has the Ventura been received? And can you characterize the different sounders between the Ventura and the Tupelo? If you want this sound, oh, I, I got you." Uh, well, first off, the Ventura has been received really well, um, more than I would imagine. I actually got part of our building staff that all they do is build Venturas now. That's how many we're selling. Um, and that's very common with a new amp. Excuse me. I have my little gum here to keep my mouth from getting dry from talking the whole time. Um, so it's been one of the best releases of amps we've ever had. A lot of it, too, is that it's a little more affordable, which makes it more accessible to people. Um, hey, Carp, how are you, buddy? So um, the difference in sound between the Ventura and the Tupelo is, is pretty distinct. Um, they're very different variations on American sounds. Um, the circuits and the transformers and everything are just really, really different between those amps. Um, the Ventura is much lower voltage than the Tupelo. Uh, it also has an EF86 in it that the Tupelo does not. It also has a 12AY7 that the Tupelo does not in there. So it's much different gain structures. So um, it's going to act a lot more like a Tweed than a Tupelo does. Um, it gets a little squishier like a Tweed does. A uh, little richer distortion like a Tweed does. It sounds, it sounds more vintage than the Tupelo does. The Tupelo sounds more like blackface forward. You know, the clean sound is very blackfacey. Uh, it's not a blackface circuit, though, but it, it acts like a blackface. There's nothing Fender about that amp at all, it, but it gets a blackface -y kind of clean sound. Also a little more modern-y, like Mike Campbell's sort of rhythm sound. Um, and uh, it's got more high-end. It's a little treblier. Um, also, uh, the distortion on the Tupelo sounds much more modern. Um, it gets pretty angry. No, not heavy metal at all, but no, I don't think that the Ventura is more aggressive. It's just a different kind of distortion. Um, I think if you go to our YouTube channel and listen to me play them both, you can kind of hear the difference. So I've got about 150 videos up of me playing guitar now. Um, if you just go to the 65 Amps YouTube channel or here on Ustream, um, and look up old videos. Just search for Tupelo and search for Ventura. And um, listen to them through good speakers or headphones if you can. My recording ring here is okay. It's not incredible, but it's good enough that you can get the idea. If you listen to it on your computer speakers, um, I don't know that you'll get the full effect. So try to listen to it through, you know, studio monitors would be the best because they're very dry and sterile and accurate. Uh, but if you have a decent set of headphones, that'll really help. You can get really, really good headphones for 85 bucks, you know. 
And that's the best way to listen to stuff, I think, when there's not outside noise around. And if you have a Macintosh, and spe especially, the sound cards are really good in a Mac. Um, so if you plug in a nice set of cans into your uh, Mac, you should be okay. Does that answer your question, Bob, New Jersey? One? Is that... Uh, Uh, let's see. Safe to say Tupelo, more modern Nashville, Ventura, more 60s Fender. Yeah, I think that's fair. I don't think that's the whole story. Um, I wouldn't sum it up that way. Um, but that statement is correct. There's a lot more to both of those amps than just those kinds of sounds. Um, you know, the Tupelo to me, you know, like the 70s kind of Fender sound, you know, Eagles, Joe Walsh, that sort of thing. The Tupelo kind of does that really well. Um, Don Felder um, sort of thing. Ted Nugent, you know, they recorded all that stuff on Deluxes. Um, Ventura is going to be more in your blues, Texas kind of vocabulary. Um very vintage if you're playing a nice Strat, especially. Um, so, yeah, the Eagles were all on little Fender combos, if you listen to that stuff. And have you seen the um, documentary that's on Showtime? Maybe it's not in England yet, but um, there's a three-hour documentary called The History of the Eagles, and every session, it's Deluxes and Princetons. That's about it. Any good stocking dealers in the Southeast? Uh, we have uh, Boutique Guitar Exchange in Atlanta. Uh, the, our dealer that has... Where are you in the Southeast? Um, no, the, Rob, the London Pro stayed the same. Um, uh, uh, the Amp House in Alabama is our biggest stocking dealer. Chris Staten is the guy you want to talk to there. And he's really good. He's super, he gives you like a 30 day trial period. Like you can try the amp for a month. And if you don't like it, return it. All you got to do is pay the shipping back. Um, he sells a lot of our amps because of that policy. And he keeps a good stock as well. But our lead times aren't that long right now anyway. They're like four weeks. So it won't be that way for long. I have a major order that we're going to start soon. Um, I think for Sweetwater. Uh, good. Carp. No, I didn't get to the pedal expo. I had a gig on Saturday and I just felt like an old man on Sunday. So I didn't do anything. Uh, yes, Chris Okiki. That is a relic. 60s relic in the back. I think it's supposed to be a 61 or something like that. It's an old relic. It's like 10 years old. An old relic. Get it? Uh, Chell says, maybe a stupid question. Does the low voltage amp sound warmer in the tone than your other amps? Or is there no difference? Uh, no, they, it depends. Like the producers are very aggressive and bright sounding because they're lower voltage, but we up the current. So, you know, current and voltage is a reciprocal relationship, and most people make low voltage amps and don't raise the current. They just drop the B plus voltage, and if you don't allow more current to come through, uh, then the amp can get kind of dull and squishy. Uh, but the way we do it, they don't. They feel very snappy and very, very, very responsive. Um, and then our tone controls are robust enough. You can kind of do what you want to do there. So, Stratocaster Mojo asks, Dan, is the Ventura kind of in between the producer and your other stuff current-wise? Yeah, the Ventura is sort of a halfway step to the low voltage, high current thing. It's The voltage on the Ventura is, if I remember correctly, uh, 70 volts lower than the Tupelo, but it's higher current. 
70, maybe even 80 volts. The Tupelo is pretty high voltage, like a black face deluxe is. It's not a deluxe circuit, though, at all, but uh, that voltage combination will give you some performance like that. It's, got a, it's a lot louder than a black face deluxe, and it's got um, a lot more ability than a black face deluxe does. As great as a black face deluxe is, I love the amp, don't get me wrong, I've had many of them. Uh, they were far from being well rounded. Just they had two or three things they do really, really good. And then they had some other stuff they don't do that great. So the Tupelo is sort of um, my attempt to design out the flaws or the, the missing parts of those kinds of amps. You know, Blackface Deluxe, uh, uh, the 6v6 Ampegs, 6v6 Gibsons, they all had really good strong points. Um, you know, like a Tweed Deluxe, not a great clean sound, fantastic dirty sound. Blackface Deluxe, great clean sound, not a real good dirt sound. You know, those sorts of things. So I'm trying to get in the middle. Ampeg Jet 22, uh, really cool distortion. Clean sound, hee, a little bit dull. You know, Gibson Explorer 18, those sorts of things. Really nice, warm, clean sound. Cool mid distortion, not cool heavy distortion. You know, they all have cool things. So, at least from my experience, that's what I'm doing. These are good questions, guys. Thank you. Keep them coming. What else do you got on your mind? So, Ustreamer922518, uh, you'll need to refresh your browser so I can see who you are. But where are you in the Southeast? Um, We got to get a little more in the southeast. Uh, in Texas, we have Guitar Resurrection. It's not really the southeast, though. It's kind of the mid south. But um, we have uh, Will Cut Guitars in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, we have Matt Baker at, I'm blanking on the name now, he's in Arlington, Virginia. Um, Poop. I'm blanking on a store name right now. I need to call him, by the way. So I'm glad we brought that up. Uh, so I guess maybe you're you've not you're not paying attention to the show. You can tell me where you are in the southeast. I'll hook you up. Also, feel free to um, drop me a note. I'll find you an amp. It's no problem. We have the Guitar Center Platinum, Platinum Room in Nashville. No, I never got in contact with Andertons. Did I see the speaker shootout from Metropolis? No, I didn't. What is that? Did George do a speaker shootout? George is Mr. Marshall. I didn't know. I haven't talked to George in a long time, actually. Probably should. What was it, Carp? Anderton's doesn't stock really high in gear. Well, we ended up at Peach Guitars in Essex. And he stocks a lot of high-end gear. Plays high-end gear. Um... And he knows what he's talking about. This is his wheelhouse. So Celestian, Scumback, and a couple others did well in his test. Yeah, you know, I, for the amount of amps that we sell, I, I have to, um, I have to uh, stick with guys I know are going to have the speakers in stock and honor the warranty. Uh, most of the smaller speaker companies only have a 30-day warranty on their speakers. I can't really sell a $3,000 amp that has a 30-day warranty on the speaker. It's not very realistic. Those companies do really well selling to guys um, um, They sell to guys that want to modify their own gear, not really to manufacturers. 
Uh, Peter Donkers asks a good question. I'll stay away from pedals, use volume on guitar, but that's not easy on a Les Paul, rewiring the old 73 LP. Uh, there's lots of ways to do that. I think if you go to, um, what's the name of that company in, I think they're in Kentucky. I'm blanking on their name. I buy a lot of, they sell a lot of pre-wired kits and stuff. They have all the schematics for different ways to bleed the treble. Basically, you put a cap on the pot. You put a little, yeah, RS Guitar Works. Thank you, Fletcher. Um... They have a lot of RS Guitar Works. That's it. Uh, yeah, maybe Mojo Tone, too. Um, Mojo Tone's in North Carolina, I think. But um, RS Guitar Works. And they will... They have all the schematics there for different... There's a lot of different ways to do it. I usually put um, a small cap on the pot across it from pin 1 to pin 3. Um, and that just lets the treble go through no matter what. Uh, it's just a bleeder, and uh, as you roll the volume pot back, the bass kind of drops out anyway, and so you get this really nice, clean sound, very acoustic-y. But I put a small cap, you know, like a 100 picofarad or something like that on there, just to let the top end come through. There, you can try different ones, and you can do all sorts of different things. There's no right or wrong there. It's just kind of what you want. I think I, sometimes I've actually put a thousand peak of arid cap on there, but it's it's no big deal. Very easy. It's not difficult at all. Wow, it's almost one o'clock. So who was it that asked about mic placement? We go all the way back up here. No, oh, it got cut off. Was it was it you, Peter? It was. Peter Donkers, you're still here, right? About mic placement. Uh, what kind of mics are you using? What kind of microphone are we talking about? Because it kind of depends. If you're using a dynamic mic, like a Shure 57 or something like that, or a... Um, uh, watch me do it all the square one, the 609, the Sennheiser 609. Um, I like to put it more out in the middle of the cone. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. If it's for live, you know, right in the middle of the cone is really good. For um, recording, it depends on what you want to do with the track. If you want to be really aggressive, you can put it right down. You're using a 57. Is this for live? Yeah, that's right, Andre. You want to... I throw ribbon mics, I put them right in the throat. Because that way you can put them up close. And the proximity effect makes it sound huge. You know, as long as you're getting the treble. Um, is this for live, Peter? Or is this for recording? There's a lag here for those of you watching the recording. It takes them a minute for the guys to answer. For the studio. Okay. Well... If you want to have a very piercing lead tone kind of thing, put the microphone right in the throat of the speaker. It's going to be really bright. And a 57 has this thing called overshoot, which means you can give it more signal than it can handle. So the diaphragm will move way too much. And it's called overshoot. And if you stick that right in the throat, you get this really cool lead sound. Um, that based on that thing called overshoot. Um, if it's for rhythm stuff, you know, experiment going out to the edge of the cone. Good night, Chell. Tell your girlfriend we said hello. Post a picture of her next time you come, please. Thanks for dropping in, Chell. We appreciate you, brother. Have a good night in Stockholm. Um... It depends on where you want to sit in the mix, Peter. Um, you know, the further you go out to the edge of the cone, the more warm it's going to get. And you'll start to lose top end that way. So it, it's kind of a, a personal preference thing, I guess, is the best way to describe it. 
Uh, depends on your band, what you're trying to achieve. Um, honestly, if I were to make any recommendation to you, it would be to get a different microphone. Um, I know a 57 is sort of the standard that most people like to use. It's not a great microphone for miking up higher-end amps. Um, uh, it's a it's a very rugged microphone that kind of works in any situation, but it's very sort of limited like this. You you tend to get a sound that's all like that, um, which is a popular sound. We've all heard that sound, and everybody's used to it. Yes, Andre, you took the words right out of my mouth. My favorite dynamic mic to use that's affordable is the Sennheiser 609. It's a much larger diaphragm than the 57, so it doesn't overshoot as much. You can make it overshoot. Um, and that 609 will sound way better on that Alnico Blue than the 57 does. Um, and if I don't know what the pricing is in the Netherlands, but here you can buy a 609 for about $125. So that's like 100 euros. Um, it's, not, it's not punishing Mike. Um, you know, it's, uh, for those of you here in the United States that watch Saturday Night Live, Jared Scharf is playing a Monterey there um, using a 609. Um, I went with him. We walked around the corner to Rudy's, who's our dealer there, and bought a 609, and we put it in there. They used to have a 57, and um, we got... I have not tried the MC930 Norwegian slow-mo. Um, I'd, I'd love to try one. I, I, just, I don't have any experience with it. But, yeah, Peter, honestly, that's the best recommendation I can make to you is... Um, Try a 609. I think you'll find it to be much, much, much more friendly. Um, Fletcher 58 says, which high-end mics do you like for recording guitar amps? It depends on the amp. Um, I'm a big fan of Royer's. Uh, the Royer 122V is my favorite. Um, the 121 being my second favorite. Um, I like to mix those. I, I usually use, um, I have a 122V. It's amazing. And I have a 121 also. Um, the thing about when you do ribbon mics is you really got to have a good preamp. You know, so it's a slippery slope. Ribbon mics are expensive. And if you don't have a good preamp, you're missing what the ribbon mic does. So you need to get a really nice preamp to really enjoy um, your ribbon mics. So it ends up getting expensive really quick. I mean, just to get a 122V and a really nice preamp, you can spend three grand. Um, guitar sounds amazing, but it's a lot of money. Um, 121s, I think, go for about $1,100. Um, you can get a nice little lunchbox style preamp, I think. You know, get a really good one for 800 bucks. Um, that's a pretty steep door charge, you know, just to go in the door there with that. Um, I like the, um, the Coles mics, the 4038s. I think if you mix those with a good dynamic mic, you'll do great. I like to put a Neumann type, um, tube mic out in the room along with that. Um, I think if you mix a ribbon and a dynamic and a tube mic for the room sound, you get as close as you can to being in the room with the guitar. Um, that's my humble opinion. Um, there's good questions here. Uh, rookie from Wyoming again. That's all right, Doug. It's okay, man. You are amongst friends here. There's no dumb questions, okay? Um, recommendations for switching between Strat and Les Paul and keeping the volume the same. Uh, all of our amps usually have a little bit of a booster switch above the tone stack and that's what that's for uh, other than that uh, get your pickups output the same you know I prefer lower output humbuckers and higher output single coils so I get all my pickups around 7k and the volume's pretty much the same does that make sense Doug 
you can modify your guitars really easy and do that. But we have a little plus minus switch on most of our amps, and that's kind of what it's for. Balance guitars out. Uh, uh, FB bunch of numbers says Dan. For so many years, I have played the late '70s Marshall JMPs. They just work for me with a Celestion G1265. Can the Empire do similar tones, or is the producer closer to that sound? Uh, that's a tough question. I think the Empire is going to be more Marshally. Um, the producer is more. It's very Eel 34 sound, but it's not just that specific Marshall thing, you know. Marshalls have a very specific little notch, like 700K. Um, that's their sound. Um, whereas the producer is a little broader than that. I mean, you can kind of dial in Marshall, but it's not Marshall. The Empire is Marshall. It's not a Marshall circuit, but we voice that to sound like that Marshall thing. Um, uh, hi, Praneet. Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking with Bagarvis, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, in Mumbai. Um, we've just had a little bit of email interaction. That's about it. We haven't spoken on the phone yet, but I got a positive response from those guys. So thank you very, very, very much for that. I appreciate it sincerely. Um, Peter Donkers says, I had some good results with a 45 degree angle on, on the cone two inches away. Yeah. I mean, it's really, you know, Peter, when you're miking, it's kind of, you get it where you like it. Um, there's no right or wrong. I mean, there's definitely, well, let me take that back. There's definitely some wrong. Um, but there's, there's 15 rights. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Um, um, there's 15 different good ways to mic up your thing. If you're going to do the 57 thing, go on my YouTube channel and look up the, hi, John, welcome back. Um, look up the, the, oh hell, I'll just find it for you here really quick. Uh, Tom Shirovsky came over, who is Brendan O'Brien's engineer. And Brendan O'Brien has a long, long history of, um, really, really good guitar sounds. And he has a trick that he does, um... Uh, let me see if I can find this. 65. Yes. Tom Shirovsky. Uh, let's see. Let me find it for you and I'll post the link. Yep, here it is. Tom Shirovsky. Um, Brendan, ha you know, he did Soundgarden and Stone Temple Pilots and he does ACDC records, and he's the guitar guy, right? And Tom came over and showed us all the trick. Oh, my God, my hair was long here. This is at my old shop. Um, I'm going to post it for you right now, Peter. And, um, yeah, Red Hot Chili Peppers, that's right. Let me make sure I can uh, post a link here, allow links. He's the guitar guy. Yeah. So this episode of Lunch with Dan Boole that I just posted um, is where Tom shows us how to use 257s and get it right. Um, actually, you can use three and you get the Brendan sound. Um, it's really cool. So basically what it is is you put... 157 right at the speaker. And then you put another one exactly out of phase. And you try to get them as out of phase as you possibly can. Like you listen in headphones and you get where it's, the sound just kind of goes down to nothing. That's when you've got it out of phase. And then on mic number two, you flip the phase on the preamp. It comes in phase with this mic. So really what you got is a dynamic mic with a diaphragm about that big. And that's overcoming the problem that the diaphragm on a 57 is like the size of a quarter. And it's really small. And so we put two of them together like that out of phase. If you put them both like this, you don't get the same effect. And they, you got to get them where they're just absolutely out of phase as much as you can. And then flip the phase on the second one. And then the other thing he does, he puts a 57 behind the cabinet. Um, and then flips that phase on that as well. So then you kind of have three diaphragm so you end up with this dynamic mic 
ultimately with a diaphragm that big. And it sounds really, really good. And you recognize the sound. And then he pushes 700K. You know, that's his thing. It's the Marshall deal. But even if you just do those mic placement things, um, then you're there. Uh, Doug Duran asks, with your bump switch, is there a foot switch for a solo type thing? Yeah, yeah, the bump's on a foot switch. That's right. Yeah, it's not 700K. I'm sorry. It's 700 hertz. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. 0.7K. Um, so watch that show, Peter, and you'll hear it. I mean, we made... I forgot what amp we were playing that day, but it sounded just like a Brendan O'Brien record. And that was using all 57s. Um, well, thank you, FB 77145703. Say that three times. Um, his question, this is a nice question, thank you. Um, when designing amps, do you take inspiration sonically from classic recordings and sounds from yesteryear? I don't find many amps inspiring, but yours are. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, somewhat. Um, you know, I was on the road playing when I was a young man for over a decade. And I had the good fortune of coming across a lot of really good amps. And I also had the really good fortune of going to a lot of shows. Uh, my parents were relatively young and um, very much into music. So they took me to see, it was kind of, you know, late 60s, early 70s, a lot of the hippie thing going on. People took their kids everywhere. So I got to go see really, really huge acts from all genres of music. You know, I saw blues guys and rock and roll guys. I saw the Stones, but then went and saw Johnny Cash and Ray Charles and the fifth dimension, you know, and then Van Halen, you know, it just like, that was when I was in eighth grade, but you know, you get the point. I, I, I had a lot of really good exposure, um, to good sounds. And so a lot of those sounds stuck in my head. And then I lived in London, um, when I was in my mid twenties and I was, having fun over there and I really really went deep on the British sound the difference between a Vox and a Marshall and a High Watt and a Watkins and a Selmer and you know all those different cool British amps the Wim amps you know those sort of things um, and they all have really neat stuff a lot of that stuff didn't make it over to America in large numbers I mean over here we kind of just know mostly Marshall Vox and a little bit of High Watt uh, I never saw Zeppelin. I really wish I could have. Um, Doug Gilliam's asking me. Um, but, there, you know, the Selmer sound is really cool. You never really saw Selmer amps over here. and They're great amps. They tend to blow up uh, running. Um, yeah, Wims are really cool. And those are like entry-level gear. You know, not expensive stuff at all. And it was really nice. Um, so I lived in London. Um, I didn't live... I drove a truck in London. Yeah, it's kind of like an English Supra. That's right. Um, and I drove a truck in central London. So um, I was done at 2.30 every day. I was delivering food. And so I worked from like 6 in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon. And where I ended my route was very close to Denmark Street. So I used to park my truck and go fart around in guitar stores. And uh, my roommate at the time worked in central London. Um, I do have the knowledge, yeah. And uh, worked in central London and needed a ride home at 6 o'clock. So from 2.30 to 6 every day, I hung out in music stores or Soho Square, you know, whatever. And I really went deep. You guys can probably figure out my level of analysis on most things is kind of neurotic. And so I decided I'm going to learn about British sounds, British amps. And, man, I just went in and I had a great time. I learned everything I could. And there's some really, really cool, distinct things that only happen in British amps. And those were a lot of inspirations. Most of our amps, you'll notice, 
if they're not specifically a British voice amp, they have a British channel on them. So even my American amps, uh, which are only a few right now, um, I want to still have those British things. And um, yeah, Sound City, they're, they're similar to High Watts. Dan Reeves was the designer on those. Yeah, Sound Cities are great. Sound Cities are very cool. Um, I left those off my list. Thank you, Doug. Um, so yeah, that's a long answer to your question. You don't have to, doesn't have to be your last question. That's a great question. Um, but I, I don't really, I don't really specifically imitate any of those. It's just, there's a feeling, there's a vibe, there's a texture, there's a taste that is still very clear in my mind from my time in London. And I try to go for that. Uh, thank you, John. John says, I can't wait for you to come over, Dan. Our store has that cool old vibe of old guitar stores. Hang out and rock out right on. Yeah, I can't wait to come over. I think I'm going to go to Norway in May, John. So maybe we need to get a few days in England on the way over. And I can do a clinic at your store. Does that sound good? May, good for you? I can either do it on the way or on the way back. It doesn't matter to me. So let me know what you think. Let me know what you think. Um, so, absolutely. Well, it worst case is I'll get a 12-hour layover in London and I'll just hop on the train and come up and see you. Um, Praneet, thank you so much for coming. Thank you again for all your help. I look forward to the rest of those contacts if you can get them for me. Ladies and gentlemen, Praneet, in Mumbai, India. I love it. Um, FB says, thanks for the answer. I lived and worked in London for 16 years. Oh, right on. Uh, I live and I had an old Selmer 60s AC30 and a 60s AC along with my old Marshalls. Yours are the only modern amps I'm considering. Well, thank you. That's, that's very nice. I appreciate that. Um, I just do what I like. Uh, I just happen to be a neurotic nerd who researches things crazy. Uh, Peter Donker says, do you consider the London to be your first amp? Yeah, that was our first amp. And that has two British voices in there. Yeah, I'm looking for any Indian dealers. Base face, Josh. Uh, thank you, Ken Christian. Come down and see me. Let me know when you're coming down. Just call the shop and... You're welcome to come by here. I can't really let you. We don't have much for you to sit around and play and enjoy. Um, thank you, FB77145703. That's very nice. I appreciate it, man. I just do what I do. I'm glad you like it. I'm very honored. Yeah, but anyway, Ken, you come down. I'll, I'll drive over to True Tone and say hi. It's not that far from here. I can get there in like 20 minutes. So, um, Yeah, man. So yeah, the London, you know, I had a 63 AC-15 that I really loved, an AC-15 twin, it just rocks. And Peter was really into the Marshall 18 watt thing back then. So we kind of combined both of those into one amp. Their phase inverter and power sections are virtually identical. So it was easy to cut two preamps in there and just have two channels. Carp, the shop is always open for you, buddy. You know that. Haven't you been here? I thought you came here with Rick. Maybe not. Yeah, I need to get Miles over here. I haven't seen Miles in a while. It's been about a month, I think. It's tough since we're downtown. Oh, I'm sorry, Carp. I could have swore you came over with Rick. He's been here a lot. Oh, excuse me. Dan Huff really loves the AC-15. For, has he any 65? I don't know if he does or not. He hasn't bought any from me. But, man, they got everything under the sun out of Blackbird. Yeah, we're still working Pasadena guitars. I'm not certain about those. I, mean, I know they had some issues there. No, he's not in the old shop. We bugged out of there completely. I think he's working out of his house now. Yes, hold on to your London for the next 50 years, Peter. Do that, definitely. 
definitely do that. Well, I hope I answered all your questions, guys. I think it's probably time to start wrapping it up. Is there anything else you want to get to before we go ahead and call it a day? This was a good chat. You guys, great questions. And uh, it's fun for me. I love explaining what we do. I hope you enjoyed it. With my drugstore reading glasses on. Great show. See you, Dan. Thank you, Carp. We'll see you soon. Bob, great session. Thank you, sir. Very much. Anything else on your mind? Base face, Josh. I know a gigging guy in Bangalore. Should I send him your way? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Lars. Lars Haugen. Everybody, Lars Haugen is here, and he's been lurking the whole time. Beatles or Stones? Okay, are you ready? Here's the answer. Wait for it. Wait for it. Both. Both. I now have permission for another guitar in the house so I can play it to Tommy when he's going to sleep. Oh, good. You're welcome. That will cost you two pints and some shepherd's pie at the local pub. Yes, but maybe an extra Ventura or a producer. Yeah, there you go. Doug, thank you for dropping by. I appreciate it. By the way, you said erotic four times today. That was neurotic. Thanks, Dan. Nick, seeing an animator. Guy. Hey, Nick, congratulations on your TV show. That's awesome. So the show will stay on Wednesdays. Yes, absolutely. Correct answer, Dan, Lars says. Hey, thanks for the nice note yesterday, Lars. I appreciate that. Pork scratchings. Yeah, man. I'm good. I love pub grub. That's the one thing I really miss <laughs> about London. Yeah, Lars, when are you coming over? Leave us with a joke. Oh, did I tell you this one already? Someone told it to me. It was last week or the week before. If I'm repeating myself, like, what's the difference between a trampoline and a banjo? Did I tell you that one? I'll give you a second to answer. You take your shoes off before you jump on a trampoline. <laughs> I think we did talk about this. That's the last joke I heard, but I really like that joke. <coughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't have any good new jokes. I think I've told you guys most of my good ones. Ooh, excuse me. Kim Jong-un walks into a bar and says, hey, why the long face? <laughs> yeah, lots of banjo hate out there. What's the difference between a banjo and a chainsaw? A chainsaw has dynamic range. <laughs> That's funny. That's a very inside music business joke. Don't get me wrong. I love banjos. Um, it's no problem. <laughs> Carp. Did it hurt when you fell from heaven because it looks like you landed on your face? Ow. You know, they're, they're thinking about extending the uh, last call at bars in California to 4 o'clock. And I think if bars, you know, bars close here at 2. Last call's at 1.30. Um, is that right? Or last call's at 1? I can't remember. I don't stay up that late anymore. Um, so there'll be lots of those ladies sticking around until 3.30. If you see a banjo leaning against a dumpster, knock first. <laughs> That's funny. I like that. That's very good. That's really good. Yeah, poor banjo players. For holy crap. Yes, man, 666 says. Yeah, I haven't heard any more good business, uh, music business jokes lately. That was the trampoline one. It really made me laugh out loud, like... You take your shoes off to jump on a trampoline. That's so violent and aggressive. I like that. Well, fellas, it's 1.20, and I am starving. What do you think? Are we good?
Which 65 amp is the best for dubstep? I don't know what dubstep is, Josh. So I will say all of them. What is dubstep? Bon appetit. Thank you, Andre. Thanks for dropping by. I appreciate it. Womp, womp, womp. Lucky you. Have a good day, Dan. You too. Yes, man. Triple six. You little devil. Yeah, I'll some pictures of my gig up. Played with Dina and, and the gang. Um, it went really well. We had a good time. There's a couple pictures on my Facebook, but uh, I think we have video. It was very good. Anyway, fellas, once again, it's April 10th, 2013. Uh, I really appreciate your time and coming by, and hopefully I'll see you next week. And uh, I'm going to try. I'm really trying. Thank you, Frank Shotoffer. Good to see you, buddy. I'm really, really trying to have sound very quickly. So we'll sort that out. Um, in the meantime, have a great week. And uh, if you can friend Kim Jong-un on Facebook, tell him to take some St. John's wort and relax. <laughs> all righty fellas john thanks for dropping by i'm glad i could help put tommy to sleep and you definitely need an acoustic guitar in the bedroom brahms lullaby it's too easy and then you can take it from there when i come over i'll i'll give you the the uh, country waltz firsthand experience anyway all right fellas take care we'll see you very soon I appreciate your time sincerely, and I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Take care.